Um, I think that the, Dr. Stallings' talk was a very, very good lead-in. Um, mm -hmm. We did rehearse, uh, the three of us, in terms of a, a call uh, earlier this, uh, or early, uh, late last year. And what I'd like to do in the next uh, 25 minutes is talk about some risk factors um, that we hear about in the news, we hear about when we read research papers, and try at the end of the talk to make some sense of what's going on and why these are risk factors. Um, I will be happy to say that I have no conflict of interests. I was asked to disclose my research funding. I am funded by Canadian Institute for Health Research, um, by the National Centre of Excellence in Canada called Allergen, and by the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation and a few other smaller organizations. I have no corporate affiliations, no contracts in food allergy, um, and uh, as actually recently promoted to director of Health, of, of health research at McGill University Health Center, I better be careful about the corporate uh, liaisons. So, um, I don't have to really define food allergy because Dr. Stallings did so very, very well. But again, to underline that this is a chronic illness that's increasingly important in health issues in Western countries. And it's the atopic disease with the most rapid trajectory in the past 25 years. We saw the... Um, <coughs> We saw the data from the uh, uh, surveys between 98 and 2006 showing numbers of diagnoses. We know from um, the school prevalence in the city of Montreal, we've had uh, two large surveys at the beginning of 2000 and 2006, which literally did show a doubling of peanut allergy early in the decade, and then a stabilizing from 0.8% to 1.6% in 2000, staying around 1.6 to 1.8% of school-aged children um, in 2006. So there has been a significant increase at the same time as there's been a stabilizing in the amount of asthma that we'd seen. And as you know, asthma was our major atopic disease health worry in the 80s and in the 90s. It was important that Dr. Stallings defined that we're talking about IgE-mediated uh, food allergy because, as you know, people talk about food allergy, and I know I tease my GI colleagues at the Montreal Children's because they're always talking about non-IgE-mediated food allergy, and I always say, I'm an allergist. It's not food allergy, it's food sensitivity, food intolerance, whatever. It's semantics, perhaps, but when we talk about IgE-mediated food allergy, we're talking about a disease that can affect between 2 and 8% of children, depending on the survey that you're talking about, is becoming increasing in prevalence in adults because more and more adults are developing food allergies to foods such as peanuts, tree nuts, and fish that are not, uh, that do not resolve over time. We have food allergies such as egg, milk, soy, and wheat, which have an outgrowth rate of between 50 and 80 percent by age of five years. And there are others that are lifelong, and these are affecting adults, these are affecting children more and more, such as peanut and tree nut, and therefore they're carrying on into adults. The most common allergens are listed, egg milk, peanut, tree nut, fish, shellfish, and sesame is becoming the emerging uh, large allergy. And the reason, as Dr. Stallings well pointed out, that we differentiate between the two diseases is that IgE-mediated food allergy is the only one related to, uh, with, with the risk of life-threatening anaphylaxis, and it's that risk that changes this disease from an individual chronic condition to a condition that affects the whole family. And m one of my colleagues in our research network called Get Facts, Susan Elliott, who's a health geographer, has worked with Anne Clark to determine that one in two Canadians is affected by food allergy in that if there is a child that's affected, the parents, the grandparents, the school, the community are affected because they have to put into safeguards for each of these children. And so it's an enormous public health problem, no less in the US and certainly in other Western countries. <clears throat> so the purpose of this talk is to really understand environmental factors that have been postulated to influence food allergy. We're gonna determine, we're gonna look at genetic risk factors. We're going to talk about what is modifiable and non-modifiable. And then, because I'm an immunologist, I wanted to try to make some sense of all of this in terms of the genetic environmental risks and say, why are these genes that people pull out of, of gene, genome-wide association uh, studies, why are these genes in particular important and how we can then start to think together as a community about modifying things for individuals? So. 
we talk about environmental factors, and here's a baby. I hope you can see that he has quite a bit of skin disease, probably some eczema, some seborrheic dermatitis as well. And we want to talk about things such as food introduction. We're going to talk about things that are influence the rest of his body, household, um, a number of people in the household, allergens uh, that he's exposed to, other infections and other environmental things that are potentially influencing the food allergy beyond just the food that he eats. And so we'll talk about aerosol exposures, uh, influence of microbiota, and dietary exposures. And I don't have to talk about dietary exposures for too long because that's been touched upon in the last talk. But one of the things that is not well understood, and I think as uh, most of us in this room are either parents or aunts or uncles, uh, some of us may be grandparents, one of the things that was always a, um, a, a concern of families was if a child had eczema and the eczema wasn't getting better, why, what, was that, what was that child eating that made the eczema worse? And I will tell you that the work that's come from Gideon Lack and many other groups, including the Health Nuts study in Australia, which was a large prevalent study of food allergy, suggests that it's not the foods that are causing the eczema, it's the eczema that's causing the food allergy. And that is because aerosol exposure via the skin, and whether it's through cooking, um, eggs being scrambled, whether it's through creams such as peanut oil-based creams, things that touch open skin change the way those antigens are perceived by the body. And I'm going to give you a diagram in a moment. So aerosol exposure via the skin or respiratory tract is a factor that is it, 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 very important in the development of allergic disease, food allergy, no less than asthma, which is a respiratory disease. The increased risk of food allergies, there's a, a very high increase of food allergies in children with moderate and severe atopic dermatitis, and this has been a major area of focus. So what is going on? If you are a food and you are taken in through the GI tract, then you go through the normal digestion process and turn into amino acids, and the, the immune system does not look upon you as a foreign invader. But if you look at this diagram, this is, a, for example, this could be a skin or a respiratory mucosal barrier. When an allergen comes through this respiratory or mucosal barrier, uh, such as the skin, dendritic cells pick up the allergen and act upon it just like it would a bacteria, a virus, or another pollutant, or another toxin. So these breaks in mucosal barrier make the environmental exposures a predisposing factor to allergy, such as food allergy. So we have, for example, certain things that don't make complete sense. In the large Australian prevalence cohorts, health nuts, dog exposure in early life was associated with diminished food allergies which is something that has also been seen in asthma. And the question is, why would dog exposure, which would be an aerosol allergen, be, a pro be something that's protective? Um, there's also a uh, correlation between increased sibling numbers. In the Australian prevalence cohort, <coughs> increased sibling numbers led to a decrease in food allergy. We'll talk about why momentarily. Other aerosol exposures, such as egg sensitization, has been linked to aerosol exposure to egg, especially in children, as I pointed out, with poor skin barriers. Um, high level of environmental peanut exposure. Non-oral environmental, meaning peanut oil-based creams, was pointed out by Gideon Lack in 2006. Other kinds of ex environmental ex uh, exposures of nuts and peanuts in, in homes, as long as it's not oral, it can be an allergen sensitizer. And as Dr. Stallings pointed out well from the LEAP study and from the new guidelines, the current data suggests that improved outcomes in food allergies, especially egg and peanut, can be achieved if these are, in, uh, are started early in life, certainly before 12 months, and the recommendation is somewhere between 4 months and 11 months. So the next major area in terms of environmental exposure that people have been very interested in is the microbiota. <coughs> Now, the microbiota, meaning your bacterial flora, the GI tract, I wandered around the posters yesterday. There were quite a few on that. I had a, a, a great talk with one of my, uh, now with a, a compatriot from Canada and a colleague from Edmonton about his work. As we know, food allergy is a GI problem, and the GI immune system is highly influenced 
by the bacterial flora in the GI tract. Oral tolerance, for example, has been shown to be influenced by clostridium species, T regulatory cells are in increased by clostridium species, but there have been very few good prospective studies about food allergy, mostly because, unfortunately, we don't get stool samples retrospectively if a child is diagnosed at 12 months or 18 months. So we have no real I good idea about the balance. Things that influence microbiota, um, cesarean section changes the intestinal flora of the child because they haven't passed through the birth canal. Breastfeeding can influence it. Obviously, early maternal or child antibiotic exposure. But all of these in various cohort studies, such as Health Nuts and other cohorts in the Canadian child um, longitudinal study, have not been particularly consistent in terms of their influences. In, and we have a large birth cohort in Canada that was, uh, that's uh, held uh, in UBC, in University of Manitoba, University of Toronto, with a few other collaborators. And one of the things that they did was they prospectively <coughs> took stool samples at three months and 12 months. And Megan Azad published last year that if you analyze the, um, the cohort, and they took 166 children, found within that group 12 with food allergy sensitization, and I'm glad the last question was asked to Dr. Stallings because by sensitization they mean either a positive skin test or a positive blood test for either egg, milk, or peanut, but not necessarily a history of food allergy, and that's a very important distinction. A skin test or a blood test means that you have IgE, it doesn't mean you have disease. But whatever the case, two things were found. One. In terms of diversity and richness, there is a, a score that, that um, underlines res, richness of GI flora called the Chow score. Um, at three months, the richness was much lower in children who were sensitized than those who were not sensitized. This difference was not apparent at 12 months. And the other thing that this pictogram shows is that the sensitized children had a lot more in the way of Enterobac uh, the, the Enterobacter <coughs> species, and a lot fewer of Bacteroides species than their compatriots who are not sensitized. The same thing was found at three months and at 12 months. A much smaller, uh, although the, the flora changed over time, the proportions stayed the same. More Enterobacteria and a, a ratio of Enterobacter to Bacteroides that was skewed for those that were sensitized or non-sensitized. So that may be where we get the correlation with siblings and dogs. Because as you, can, as you can imagine, although the dog is an aeroallergen and the children are maybe a bacterial allergen, microbiota is likely to be influenced by presence of dogs, much more so, as we know from Dennis Ownbean's work and other work in Europe, much more so than the presence of cats. Um, maybe the presence of turtles, I don't know. And uh, children, of course, also bring in pathogens from outside, so the more siblings, the more diversity, the richer your microbiota might be. Therefore, that might influence what's going on. However, these are difficult studies because timing may be everything. It may be the influences, like introducing peanut at four to six months, or like introducing egg, and I didn't show you the milk study, which suggested introducing milk in the first week of life changed tolerance to cow's milk for uh, up to age five years. Timing may be everything. It's very difficult to study in humans. However, work like Ben was doing that we were discussing last night, which, where you can use it as a modifiable factor in mice, may lead us to understand the tolerance that microbiota can bring and develop better probiotics. Um, so, let's talk about genetics in the last few minutes and then try to tie things together. So the incidence of food allergies is highly increased in children of atopic individuals. We've known for decades, since the 50s, that atopic diseases skewed in families. There's a much higher concordance of food allergy in siblings, and we are finding through larger and larger genetic cohorts better, better and better tools to detect these gene influences. So for example, in our uh, large uh, cross-Canadian study on food allergy called Get Facts. I work with a group that has, worked, that has developed a large peanut cohort over a thousand cases over uh, across Canada and Clark, Moshe Ben Shashan, Yukasai, Denise Daly, who's our geneticist, um, say they've been collecting data on peanut allergy patients and I'll show you how some of this has been used in order to find um, different genes that are susceptibility factors. 
So peanut allergy is highly heritable. There's a 64% concordance among monozygotic twins, 7% among dizygotic twins. The risk ratio of a per, uh, uh, the risk ratio in if you're a relative of a peanut allergic child, if you're a sibling, is 6.7 to 13.5%. It's a huge amount of genetic influence. And where can that come from? And when people were looking for candidate genes, which was taking a sample of, I don't know, 20, 40, 60 people and looking for candidate genes, it was almost impossible to find good hits that were robust. So here's one, um, uh, I guess it's a quiz, but I don't know if we're going to actually play quiz here. I do this with my, with my students. I ask, what, uh, look at this lady's hands. What genetic condition gives you very, very, very dry, scaly skin? Anybody want to try? It keeps people awake. So what, anybody, yell it out. No? Well, that's ichthyosis vulgaris. That's not what I'm talking about. But the most common genetic mutation in ichthyosis vulgaris is filigrin. So filigrin is a protein that is a natural moisture factor protecting, it's got natural bactericidal properties, protects against staphylococcus and it keeps other proteases within the skin in terms of bacterial defense. And this is a picture of, of, the, of the skin, and it's found somewhere within the granular and spinous layer of the skin. And filigan mutations have been found to influence barrier uh, permeability in other diseases, including asthma. And so our group, with a Scottish group, uh, sorry, with an Irish group, got together and looked at the incidence of peanut allergy using a large cohort-based um, uh, investigation and found and published a couple of years ago that, there, that the, a loss of function variant in filigrin was a significant risk factor for peanut allergy. In fact, it increased the risk of peanut allergy two to three times. So this became the first real heritable factor. If you had a genetic mutation giving you a mild even loss of function in filigrin, your mucosal permeability was changed to the point that it would increase your risk of peanut allergy. And hence, Yuka Asaya, who, who's, who was at the time a grad student, became big news and was, all, was on CNN and, and the CBC, etc. cetera. Um, so this was the first really strong association. Now, there have been other associations pointed out, but they've never been well substantiated. And I'm going to give you a second strong genetic association that has now been substantiated using large cohorts. So the first clue was work that was done through our peanut allergy registry uh, that's housed at McGill, and a grad student named Madore published in 2013 using a, using a candidate gene approach but having over 300 kids in the study that an association that had been seen for asthma in HLA-DQB1 uh, which is a gene in antigen presentation, which I will explain and demonstrate to you in a moment, um, was um, uh, also associated with peanut allergy in uh, a cohort of 317 children with peanut allergy. So this was published in 2013. Using a genome-wide association study um, and the Chicago food allergy cohort with 21 100 cases of food allergy in general, including 316 peanut allergy cases, and, impu and, and looking in, in what was called 144 hypercontrols, meaning people worth absolutely no family history of allergy, A to P food allergy, plus 1,700 non-allergic controls but not well characterized. The group in Johns Hopkins found that there were several hits within the HLA human lymphocyte antigen histico major histocompatibility complex, all on DR and DQ in chromosome 6. And this not only was a small um, a single nucleotide polymorphism changes, but there were also changes in methylation that led to change, potential changes in function in antigen processing and presentation. This was further confirmed by another GWAS by Martino and Ferrero published this year. It, but they, it was a small study with 73 patients and 148 <coughs> controls. And then finally, our group, and I, can't, I didn't put it on the slide because I know the slides are going to be distributed, but it's now in second review with JACI, um, where we were able not only to confirm the 
um, association with HLA-DR um, in terms of the same SNPs that Hong found in a group of 880 peanut allergic children, which was double the numbers, or more than double the number that they used. Plus, we found three other immune response genes, one of which had been found in asthma, that likely were sentinel genes that changed the way the immune system saw proteins leading to peanut allergy. So what have we learned? What do we learn from these environmental studies? And what do we learn from this alphabet soup of genome-wide association sequences? How does this all come together? So I'm just going to provide a little bit of data from Health Nuts and then a little bit of mechanistic immunological data. So we have um, from this Australian, large Australian uh, study, they have found several things that we can do early in life. The first is, well, the seven things that we can do and several things that we can't do. So the non-modifiable risk factors, of course, is your family, are your family history. Yeah, you, you, they say, you know, you can pick your friends and you can pick your nose, but you can't pick your parents. Um, the second thing is, obviously, genetic mutations. If you have a filigrin loss of function mutation, that's a non-modifiable risk factor. However, you can do better skin care if you know that you're at high risk. The other things that are important to know is, and this is for all of us who have friends, relatives, etc., maternal consumption of egg during pregnancy did not increase the risk of food allergy. And in fact, we know from other studies for, since, uh, since Rob Zeiger published in the 80s that maternal consumption during pregnancy of any food does not influence food allergy. And in fact, all it does if you go on an elimination diet in pregnancy is lead to poorly nourished children, and certainly not uh, improvement in allergic outcome. Um, cesarean section delivery was not associated in their cohort with uh, increase in food allergy. Other modifiable food actors, what can you do? Well, you can buy a dog while you're pregnant because dog exposure early in life seemed to decrease the risk. You could have lots of children. That's a wonderful thing to do if you want. But the things that you should absolutely try to avoid is late introduction of certain solids. So late introduction of egg, for example, later than 10 months of age, was associated with higher incidence of egg allergy. Early introduction was associated with lower incidence of egg allergy. So the egg, now we have the egg from health nuts, we have peanut from leap, etc. Not associated with food allergy, breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is wonderful. Breastfeeding has so many uh, positives. I work with Mike Kramer, who's a breastfeeding guru. There are many things that breastfeeding does. It doesn't prevent a food allergy, unfortunately. It might not change microbiome. In fact, probably whatever the mother's microbiome is influences the baby's both through her contact and through breastfeeding. Um, and it's not just the breastfeeding alone. Age of uh, uh, maternal consumption of egg during breastfeeding, etc. Cat exposure doesn't change any things. And antibiotics in the health nuts uh, did not change. Other potentially modifiable risk factors, low vitamin D is important to correct, and good sun exposure, like in San Diego, usually is important. Infant eczema may be a modifiable risk factor in that you can cream a child and decrease the barrier permeability. So let's make some sense of this barrier permeability and HLA quandrum, which we found in genetic studies. So as we said earlier, if your skin barrier is disrupt, is if you are taking in things through the skin, be it because you have eczema or because you have a barrier permeability problem such as filigrin, you are increasing the type of antigen exposure to your um, antigen presenting cells like Langerhans cells in the skin, other dendritic cells in the gut or in the, um, in the lung, and therefore if you are genetically predisposed, not everybody, but genetically predisposed, you may produce more cytokines that skew you to make IgE, such as IL-4 and IL-13. So in the genetically predisposed individuals, having a barrier permeability problem may lead to more allergy. The thing that was really interesting in Health Nuts was that they found that in looking at filigree mutations in their uh, over 2,500 person cohort, the, the number of children who had asymptomatic sensitization, i.e. a positive skin test but passed a challenge, and a positive skin test and failed a challenge was the same. 
So this discordance suggests that just the skin, if you can correct the skin barrier problem and you don't have another risk factor, you don't necessarily de de uh, develop food allergy. And certainly you should always try to minimize these types of exposures through the skin. Now let me give you Bruce's <coughs> rapid discussion of antigen processing so we can wrap this up nicely. This is a dendritic cell. What dendritic cells do is they take an antigen, they chew them up, and then they take peptides and they present them to T cells on a molecule called MHC class two, which was where D uh, HLA-DR is, uh, is expressed. And it allows for <laughs> communication between the cells that process the antigens and the cells that will predispose people to making either IgE antibodies or tolerance uh, antibodies like IgG4 or IgA. So here's, now this is an HLA molecule. And we know that individuals who have certain changes in their HLA molecules that will allow them to see antigens different from other people will get certain types of immune responses that are completely different. For example, there is, an, there is a, a, a group of individuals with HIV who have a particular sensitivity to one of the HIV drugs. And the reason is that not because of their HIV necessarily, it's because of a common polymorphism in HLA typing that processes this drug differently than others. And so when the drug, which is in orange, is in the cleft of the HLA molecule, the way it's presented talks to the T cells in a way that they make IL-4 and you make IgE and you have severe allergic reactions. In a similar vein, industrial workers who are exposed to beryllium, a small percentage will develop a chronic lung disease called chronic beryllium disease, which is a, um, which is a granulomatous disease of the lung. Why do some workers who are exposed to this heavy metal, uh, which is very, very common in auto industries, airplane industries, even in dental amalgams, why do some people get the disease and others don't? Because there's a polymorphism in antigen processing in the HLA that leads people who are predisposed to process beryllium in such a way as to stimulate their T cells to be active, whereas other people see beryllium and they actually don't respond to it at all and it's a particular process, antigen processing polymorphism. And so when you have this setup of an HLA molecule talking to a T cell, the way the antigen is picked up and the configuration of your HLA molecules may change the way we see the antigen and the difference between me and a, an allergic person and anyone in this room who's not an allergic person may just be the way we're made. We're made to process antigens in a different way. And if we know this genetic susceptibility, then we can build much better prevention strategies. So the take home points, the risk of food allergies may be influenced by the environment and certainly by dietary exposures. Antigen handling and antigen presentation, which is something fundamental to how we see everything in life that comes in through our nose, through our skin, through our gut, is an important likely genetic risk factor. Some of these factors, such as diet and skin barrier and siblings and dogs, are modifiable. We need more an understanding of the gut, gut microbiota to, under, to be able to determine how our modulation of the gut microbiome can help us and can lead to better oral tolerance that way, but also to decrease our risk of problems with, if we have the genetic predisposition in terms of antigen processing. So is food allergy prevention possible? So this is... That's my grandson, one of them, who's got a little piece of bamba in his mouth at the age of four and a half months. And here he is, at, he's going to be three soon, and he has no food allergies, and he's a very happy guy. So let's uh, try to stick to that paradigm, as Dr. Stallings had pointed out earlier. Thanks very much.